<laughs> Misha, it's my very great pleasure. You are our first Ukrainian speaker uh, in this lecture series of uh, the Haki Vienna International Science School. We've had a really good run so far, and uh, we are really excited about your upcoming lecture on shuffling cards. Uh, Misha, привіт uh, to you. The floor is yours. All right, great, thanks. So, so всім привіт. Um, once again, and so uh, I'll talk today about card shuffling, and you should think of it really as just an example of a topic in applied mathematics or so in probability, which I think gives a nice overview of how research in applied mathematics um, looks like. So we usually start with some kind of motivation, which you know will be part zero of the lecture. And so in this lecture, we will be interested in shuffling cards. So, you know, um, roughly speaking, we want to analyze various different card shuffles. And so, you know, to start with, let me give you two examples of shuffles that will come up in this lecture. So one is sort of a very naive example of a, a card shuffle, which you know will be useful for our discussion, but maybe not so useful when you actually try to shuffle cards at home. So it's maybe something that maybe your younger sibling, maybe your grandparent might do to shuffle cards. So that would be the so-called top to random shuffle. Okay, so um, what does it mean? How does it work? So we we'll start off with a deck of cards. And of course, since we're mathematicians, we don't have to have 52 cards. We can have some number n of cards in our deck. And so the top to random shuffle would work as follows. So you um, just pick the top card, and then you would insert it at random into the deck. OK, so you, you just pick up the top card, whatever it is. And then you reinsert it somewhere. So let me mark it in blue here. So let's say you inserted it here. OK, and so again, I emphasize that the position at which you insert the card will be random. And then you repeat. Right, so you just keep going like this. And you know we will see later in the lecture how efficient or inefficient this way of shuffling cards actually is. OK, so that would be kind of a simple example for us to analyze. A more realistic example of a card shuffle is something that you maybe do yourself when you shuffle cards. And that would be the so-called riffle shuffle. OK, so what you do in that case is the following. So you, again, start with a deck of cards, so some number n cards. So it could be one deck or two decks and so on. And what you do here, you shuffle in two steps. So first, you split the deck at random into two parts, right? So you kind of lift up, lift off the top part of the cards. So for example, the first five cards, so in some random way. So you will have kind of one pile of cards here and another pile of cards here. Okay, so I'm splitting the deck into two, again at random. And in the second step, I'm kind of riffling through the cards so that these cards on the left, let me again mark them in blue, are randomly introduced into the part of the deck which is on the right, right? So at the end, of a riffle shuffle, again, you have combined all your cards into one deck and in some random positions, and you know, these cards from the left deck, so this one, this one, and maybe this one, are now part of the overall deck. Okay, so I want to emphasize that in both shuffles, the steps that we apply are random, and so what I described was you know, one shuffle and then 
usually again you would repeat um, to make sure that at the end of the day you got a, a deck which is well shuffled right and so the ruffle shuffle is also interesting kind of commercially for casinos because that's also something that actual casino machines are doing in a typical Las Vegas casino in the US for example all right so that is sort of um, the object we want to analyze and what will be the question for us today so the question which we will discuss is how often you need to shuffle until you get a well shuffled deck right so typically you know you start shuffling cards and you want to have some idea when to stop so at what point you have a fairly random configuration of cards and you know you can actually start playing with them okay so the question is how many shuffles do we need until the deck is well shuffled okay so this will be the question of interest and so that's sort of the typical situation in applied mathematics so you start off with some phenomenon in the real world so here with card shuffling and then you know the first step you have to make is to turn it into mathematics so when you do pure math you immediately have some kind of math problem to start from in applied math you know you start from some natural phenomenon and then you have to first turn it into math so this will be you know part one of the lecture if you like so we will turn the kind of question in words into mathematics okay and so to do that um we will do kind of two things so first we will set up a mathematical model um, for card shuffling and this will involve an object called markov chains so a kind of basic object in probability and then we will discuss kind of tools that we might be able to apply to actually analyze card shuffling. okay but let's start with a model and so to model um, card shuffling as i just mentioned we will use markov chains and let me first explain very briefly what those are in, in general right so markov chains are random processes so typically you have a bunch of states for example three of them okay so for example three possible states of the economy or you know in our case we would have the n factorial orders in which the cards can be in our deck but to start with let's think of a markov chain just with three states and the markov chain will be a process which transitions between these states so it sort of jumps around between states one two and three in, in my picture and it does so at random with certain probabilities so for example you could have a, a markov chain like this so if you're in state one you can either jump to two or to three and let's say for example that happens with equal probability of one half if you're in state two you might jump back to state one let's say with probability one third or you could jump to state three with probability two thirds and if you're in state three um, you could jump to state one let's say with probability a quarter and to state two with probability three quarters okay so when I draw this diagram so the vertices of my graph represent the different states the arrows and directed edges represent where you can go so from which state to which state and the numbers on the edges so um, you know sometimes we call them weights represent the probabilities to make a certain transition okay and so what I explained just now is usually referred to as a graphical 
representation of a Markov chain. So if you like things like graph theory or combinatorics, this could be a kind of a convenient representation for you. Um, however, for computations, sometimes we work with a different representation, which is known as a matrix representation of a Markov chain. And so what I just drew in my graph, I can also represent as a matrix in the following way. Okay, so I can make kind of a table of these probabilities, right, as follows. So I think of rows and columns of my matrix as representing the different states. So if I have three states, I will end up with a three by three matrix. And I just list the various probabilities in my table, right? So if I'm in state one, I'm staying in state one with probability zero, according to, to my graph. I'm going to state two with probability one half, state three with probability one half. Similarly, if I'm in state two, I'm never staying there, um, but rather have a probability of one third to go to state one, probability of um, bum, 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 of uh, two thirds to go to state three. And if I start in state three, I can go to state one with probability a quarter and state two with probability three quarters. Okay, so these two representations are completely equivalent, but you know sometimes it's more convenient to work with this matrix. Sometimes it's more convenient to work with the graph. Okay, and so the relevant example for us uh, will be the example corresponding to card shuffling, right? So if I have a deck with 52 cards, right, then kind of the different states, so instead of these states one, two, three, the different states will be the different orders of cards in my deck, right? And so, of course, we all know, um, since you guys are Olympiad kids, I'm sure you know that the total number of orders is 52 factorial, right? And factorial in general. Um, and um, the um, you have certain transition probabilities to go between these states, right? So these transition probabilities they are a bit uh, more difficult to write down. And so in general, they will somehow depend on the shuffle. Right, so if you have some given order of cards, we can figure out what are the possible orders that we can get to, right? And if you think about, for example, the top to random shuffle, um, if you have some order that you start from, you cannot get to too many other orders, right? Because when you take your top card, you have 52 positions where you can reintroduce it. So you can only go to 52 other states out of the 52 factorial. So it's a very tiny number of states that you can go to. And so among those states, you have equal probability. So you would have transition probabilities of one over 52 for these two, uh, for, for these 52 possibilities of places that you can go to. All right. So, um, okay, so that's kind of the setup. And now to be able to answer our question about how many shuffles we need, um, we need to understand what it means for a deck to be well shuffled, right? So, um, you know, in addition to our model, we need to kind of introduce the relevant mathematical concept within the model. And so the question is, um, if, if I want to understand um, how many shuffles I need, I need to somehow make mathematical sense of the word well shuffle. Okay, so how might we be able to do that? So first of all, it's easy to imagine what it would mean for a deck to be perfectly shuffled, right? So kind of perfectly random. 
what would that mean? It would mean that the probability of any given order of cards, let me write O for these orders, is equal exactly to one over 52 factorial. Right, so if you manage to shuffle the cards, and at some point you realize that all the possible orders of cards are now equally likely, then your deck is somehow perfectly shuffled, right? So then it's you know as random as possible. And so then certainly you can start playing with those cards. But typically, and for those shuffles that I have described, this will actually never be the case. So if you actually find a, you shuffle the cards a finite number of times, so let's say five times or 10 times, then you, know, you might hope to be somehow close to the situation of perfectly shuffled, but there is no reason why all orders would have exactly the same probability. Okay, so somehow when we're talking about a well-shuffled deck, what we want to make sense of is somehow the statement that the probability of any given order O is approximately one over 52 factorial. Okay, so we cannot be exactly at this uniformly random uh, situation, but maybe we can be close enough to it that in practice it will not matter. And so how can we make this precise? Okay, so let me um, introduce uh, a little bit more notation. So let me write x1, or maybe x0, x1, x2, etc. for the sequence of the random orders that I get from shuffling. So x0 is actually not random, right? It's just the original order of cards, whatever it is. And then since my shuffling algorithm is random, after one shuffle, when I get the next order of cards, x1, um, this order will be already random. And then as I keep shuffling, I introduce somehow more and more randomness. So, so things will remain random. And so if I want to make sense of this approximate equality here, I will somehow compare the probability that my deck of cards is in some given order O, and I will compare such probabilities to one of a 52 factorial, or in general, if I have n cards, I'll just put one of a n factorial. And so typically, the way we compare these numbers is by taking the absolute value of the difference and then summing over all the possible orders O, and for kind of historic reasons, we put a one half in front. So the one half is not so crucial, but what we look at is you know the sum of absolute values. And what we want to say for a deck to be well shuffled is that the sum is close to zero, right? So if it was exactly zero, then of course the probability to be in any given order would be one over n factorial. And so we would be perfectly shuffled. And so now instead we want to be close to zero. And you know, to be completely precise, what we ask is that this number is smaller than some given constant. So the C is you know, some given uh, positive number. Okay, so um, you know, the typical choice is you know something like one over e or, or one half or one third so some number strictly less than one uh, and typically you know smaller than one by, by some margin so like one half or one third and so we speak of well shuffled when the sum here becomes smaller than this prescribed number okay so um again sort of a typical example is one of it. Um, okay, so as an exercise, 
which I will not do to save us some time, you can check that if you look at this expression, so this sum, which we're interested in, um, you can check that this green stuff is non-increasing in K. Okay, so as you continue shuffling, actually, no matter what your random shuffling algorithm is, you will get closer and closer to the perfectly shuffled deck. So this somehow distance from being perfectly shuffled can only go down. Okay, so that's um, one thing that you, you can ponder on at home. And in fact, typically, when we look at this you know, green quantity as a function of k, you see some kind of graph like that. So you start somewhere, typically close to one, but so with some, say, fairly large number. And then you keep shuffling. And at some point, this green quantity drops pretty close to zero. So typically, you have some kind of fairly narrow window um, in which your this screen quantity describing of uh, how well shuffled the deck is goes from some number far from zero to pretty close to zero. And so therefore, it turns out that in most cases, the value of this constant C is actually not so important. So whether you choose one half or one quarter or one third, you know, you will get fairly similar uh, answers or fa fairly similar uh, value of K after which you will fall below C, right? And so at this point, we can um, write down sort of the math formulation of our question from the first slide, right? And so kind of the rigorous math formulation now goes as follows. So we need to find the smallest k, right, such that the green quantity is smaller than c. Okay, so if you want to be completely precise, so we are given some kind of shuffle, right? So for example, top to random, and we are given some number c greater than zero. And now our task is to find the smallest k such that our, this green quantity falls below c, right? And so when that's the case, we call the deck well shuffled and, and, and we stop, right? So that's when the casino will stop the shuffling machine and will actually deal the card. All right, so that's the mathematical question which we will discuss now in detail. And so, um, I'll first talk about sort of the theoretical analysis, so some sort of general theory for how we might be able to analyze this question. And then we could take a short break. And after the break, we can discuss the application to the actual card shuffles from the first slide. Okay, so let me first, while we're reasonably fresh, talk about general theory. And then you know we can finish with the fun part of actually doing the application. All right. So how can you possibly answer this math question? So the key idea, which is due to Aldos and Diaconis, and that you can find in their paper referenced on the first slide, um, is to look at so-called stopping rules. Okay, so what is a stopping rule? So let me start now with the mathematics. Okay, so the stopping rule um, will be a function. So it will take some sequence of orders. Okay, so you're shuffling the cards. You have some initial order x zero, and then you know I really start shuffling. And I start getting some new orders, x1, x2, and so on, right? And so my uh, stopping rule will take the sequence of orders 
that they got. Um, and for each such sequence, it will produce a number, so a natural number, um, you know, between zero and infinity. And, you know, we can include infinity, even though in most cases, um, T actually never takes the value infinity. Okay, and so what does it mean to be a stopping rule? So it means that we have a function um, of this form with the property that if I have two sequence, so such that if T on my sequence evaluates to some number J and now Michel starts shuffling and he has his own sequence, right? So he will start shuffling. So he will get, you know, some different sequence of orders. But let's imagine that randomly he got a sequence which coincides with mine for the first J elements. Okay, so imagine the situation that this function T evaluated to J for my sequence, and Michael has a sequence on which, uh, so which coincides with my sequence up to the J's order. So then um, I require that T for me it will be the same as the T that Michael will get. So the T for him will be also J. Okay, so this sounds a little bit convoluted and complicated, but it's actually quite simple, right? So to put it in simple terms, what this definition says is that if the stopping rule evaluates to J, it means it depends only on the first J orders in my sequence. So only on the orders I get from the first J shuffles. Okay, and so typical examples would be something like this. So T could be um, the first, so the number of shuffles until something happens. So for example, until um, the king of hearts is on top. Okay, so I keep shuffling, right? And imagine that I keep looking at the top card. So what top card I get after each shuffle. And let's say it decides so that as soon as king of hearts is the top card, I stop. Okay, so this, as you can check, is a stopping rule because if I stop after five shuffles, it means that after five shuffles, the king of hearts was on top and it was the first time it was on top. And so if now Michael starts shuffling and he gets exactly the same orders of cards um, in the first five shuffles, he will also stop after the fifth shuffle because after the fifth shuffle for him, also the king of hearts will be on top and it, it's not on top before. Okay, so typically a stopping rule is just, you know, what the name suggests. So you come up with some kind of criterion like king of hearts on top. And as soon as the criterion is satisfied, you stop, right? So that, that's it. Okay, so why is it useful to us? Well, um, the reason is the following. So we can now introduce very special stopping rules. Okay, so the idea is to have a stopping rules which somehow cleverly encodes that the deck is well shuffled. And such stopping rules will be called um, uniform. So usually they're called strong uniform um, rules or times, but since the word strong will be out of context here, let, let, let us just call them uniform 
stopping rules. Okay, so we call a stopping rule uniform if the following is true. So if I look at the probability that my stopping rule happens after J shuffles, right? And so, um, okay, so it's I stop after J shuffles and let's say I look at the order I have after these J shuffles. Okay, and so suppose I look at the probability that I stop after J shuffles and I get a particular order O. And so we call a stopping rule uniform if this probability is the same for all orders, right? So in other words, if at the moment I stop shuffling, all orders are equally like. Okay, so in other words, we imagine that I came up with some criterion such that if this criterion um, is satisfied, all orders of cards are equally like. So the deck is perfectly shuffled. Okay, and so mathematically, what it means is that each of these probabilities is simply the probability that I stop after J shuffles divided by N factorial, right? So, so, so the probability of T equal to J is somehow split evenly among all the possible orders that I could see at that time. Okay. And so now comes sort of the main theorem, the main insight of Eidos and Diaconis in this con context. It says that if I have such a clever stopping rule, so if T is a uniform stopping rule, okay, so at the moment, you know, it's not clear how on earth you would construct such a thing, but uh, let's imagine we manage to construct it. So if we have such a situation, then we can actually say something about the quantity in green from the previous slide. So I can then really understand um, how well shuffled my deck is after a given number of shuffles, right? So um, again, this green quantity I had before was taking the probability I see um, any given order O after K shuffles, I compare this to one over N factorial. So the probability for a perfectly shuffled deck, I sum over all orders O, and this is the quantity I want to be small. And so the theorem of Aldous and Diaconis says that we can estimate this quantity from above by the probability that T is greater than K. Okay, so we will prove this theorem in just a second, but the key point is that we can somehow manage to estimate the quantity of interest in terms of our uniform stopping rule, right? And intuitively, it kind of makes sense, right? Because if you have a uniform stopping rules, it means after this random time T, so this random number of shuffles T, you have a perfectly shuffled deck. So the probability that T is bigger than K simply means that it should take you more than K shuffles to get a well-shuffled deck, right? So somehow the probability on the right, at least intuitively, it makes sense that it has something to do with how well your deck is shuffled. All right, so let me prove the theorem. And so that will be kind of the end of the first part. So let's kind of gather our strengths for the proof, then take a quick break, and then we will apply this thing. Okay, so let me start the proof with an exercise that you guys, um, your folks can do. Right, so um, as an exercise, you can check that our distance, so the way we measure how well shuffled we are, so this quantity here, let's keep calling it the green quantity. 
um, can be actually represented slightly differently. So it's actually the same as the maximum of all sets of orders. So these A's uh, sets different orders, right? So for example, it could be either the order that the original deck was packed in, right? So you have all the hearts, all the spades, and so on from top to bottom, let's say. And then you take the opposite order, you combine the two. And so these two orders form the set A. And so now you take the maximum of all possible A's and you compare the probability that um, my deck after K shuffles is has one of those orders. We compare that to um, the number of orders in A over N factory. Okay, so in other words, we can compare the probability of A after K shuffles to the probability of A if the deck was uniform. Okay, so this is something that you can use as a homework again. And so taking that for granted, I, I can give you the proof. Right, so we will start. So, so now, kind of the green quantity has turned into, you know, this object here. And so, um, I can now try to analyze it. And so, I'll start with the probability that x k is an a, so that I get one of the orders in a after k shuffles. Okay, and so I will just first use a case distinction and kind of split this um, event into um, different pieces. Okay, so I can look at um, the different probabilities of xk being in A and t being equal to j. So now I'm introducing this um, uniform random time from the theorem, right? And then I have the possibility that xk is an A and t is bigger than k, right? So all I'm saying here is that my capital T has to take some value between zero and k, or it has to be bigger than k, right? And so I split my event according to these k plus two different possibilities, all right? Uh, so now I will use the definition of a uniform random time, right? And so I will use it to compute this yellow quantity here, right? So we know that if t is equal to j, it means that at time j, so after j shuffles, all the orders are equally likely, right? And since k is always bigger than j. If I continue shuffling now, all the orders will remain equally likely. And so this yellow quantity will be just the probability that xk is an a. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Sorry. Uh, it's a probability that t is equal to j. times the number of orders in A divided by N factor, right? So if T is equal to J, then all orders are equally likely. And so if I want to be in any of the orders in A, what's the likelihood of that? Well, just the number of orders in A uh, over N factorial, because each order has probability one over N factorial. Okay. And so then there's, this last probability, so the green stuff over here, I can just multiply and divide by the probability that uh, T is bigger than K, right? So I can write it in the same way, divided by the probability that T is greater than K, and then multiplied again by the same probability that T is greater than K. Um, all right. Um, okay, 
But now I can just compute the sum, right? So I sum the probabilities that t is equal to j. So that's the probability that t is between zero and k. But that's one minus the probability that t is bigger than k. And then, you know, I have this constant size of a, number of orders in a over n factorial. Uh, all right. And then, you know, this second term over here, I just leave alone. So I, I just copy it down here. Okay. And so now I'll just uh, rewrite this expression. So I multiply out. So one times a over n factorial is a over n factorial. And then I will have, I will factor out the probability that t is bigger than k. And so I will be left. So with this ratio, this purple ratio here, uh, minus a over n factorial, right? So I have the purple stuff minus a over n factorial, right? Okay, but now if we think about it, so this purple stuff is somewhere between zero and one, right? So it's not negative because probabilities are not negative. So the ratio will be not negative and the probability in the denominator is bigger. So the ratio can be at most one. And similarly, if I look at this ratio, A over N factorial, right? So A is some set of orders, but they have N factorial orders in total. So the size of A is at most n factorial. So this ratio is also at most one. So in other words, when I take this difference, it's some number between minus one and one, right? And so now if I compare the left-hand side and the right-hand side, so this probability here, and uh, okay, I compare it to this number here. So A over n factorial, I see that these two numbers can differ at most by the probability that t is bigger than k, right? So, um, yeah, just because this probability is multiplied by something between minus one and one, right? So therefore, I see that if I compare the probability I started from with a over n factorial, um, these two can differ by at most the probability that t is bigger than k. And then I'm done, right? Because on the left-hand side, I can take the maximum of all a. Um, so that will lead me back up here. And so it will lead me to this green quantity, which I wanted to estimate. And apparently we indeed estimated that by the probability that t is bigger than k, right? So we arrive exactly at the bottom line in my theorem. So why not? All right, so after this somewhat uh, heavy proof, let's maybe take a quick break. So I'd suggest maybe five minutes and then we will apply this very nice result to analyze an actual card shuffle, namely the top to random shuffle in five minutes. Hey, thanks a lot, uh, Misha. Uh, there's actually, there are questions coming up. Ah, yes. So, uh, yeah, we can discuss the questions as part of the break. Let's see. Um, okay, so let me go kind of from bottom to top. Could, okay, so David is asking, could you explain how to prove that certain shuffling allows to get any order of cards? Okay, for example, how to prove that for the shuffling you mentioned at the very beginning. Right. So, okay. So that's actually not so complicated. So let, let, let's look at the top to random shuffle, right? So the question is, how can we see that we can get from any order to any other order, right? So let's say you start with some order. Um, let's say for simplicity, we number the cards from one to 52. We start maybe with the order where we have one on top, then two and so on. And the bottom card is 52. And let's say we want to arrive at the reverse order, for example. So 52 on top, 51, and so on, one at the bottom. So how can we see that we can um, you know, change the order like that? Well, just because 
when we insert the top card, we can insert it sort of in the right place, right? So when I start with the one to 52 order, I will take the one, the card on top. If I put it at the bottom, right? Which might happen because I inserted at random. Okay, then one is already at the bottom now. And then in the next step, when I take the top card, which is now the two, there is you know, some non-zero probability that I will insert the two exactly on top of the one. So as the second bottom card and so on and so forth, right? So there is some non-zero probability that in fact, in um, you know, 51 uh, steps, I guess, you will arrive at the reverse order. Okay, and so now, um, okay, so that tells you that there is a non-zero probability to go from any given order to any other order. And then, in fact, you know, when, when you learn more about Markov chains, you learn that in any Markov chain, as soon as something has non-zero probability, it will actually happen eventually with probability one. So if you can go from one state to another state with positive probability in some number of steps, then inevitably at some point you will reach this other state. Okay, so even if you know luck is not on your side and you are not randomly inserting the cards exactly in the right place, still inevitably at some point you will reach this other order. But this is something that you would have to prove. So it's not not, not a straightforward. Um, so it's, you know, it's actually a theorem that you have to prove. Okay, so let me go sort of from David's question up. Um, I, I think Dmitro already answered it. Um, okay, there is a link to the paper. Um, ah, okay, so th then there is a very good question from Ashir. So I think he refers to this green quantity that we were looking at to, to describe how well shuffled the deck is. And so he is asking, is it true that this quantity always approaches zero as you shuffle more and more? And the answer is yes, right? And basically, um, well, so, so the, I can kind of indicate how, how you would prove it, right? So if, so, so what, what you prove first is that this quantity drops strictly below one at some point. So if you can show that, let's say after 100 shuffles, the screen quantity is strictly below one, so let's say below one half, then kind of another little proof shows that when you do another 100 shuffles, you will be below one half squared. So you get kind of this sort of geometric sequence. So if after 100 shuffles, you drop below one half, then after 200 shuffles, you drop below a quarter. After 300 shuffles, you drop below one eight and, and so on. And so therefore, because you're dominated by this sequence, you know, this geometric sequence, you will always go to zero. So um, yeah, so, so that's indeed the case. Um, okay, so I think there was another question. Uh, blah, blah, blah. So there are, okay, two more questions. One from Ashier, one from Loom. I just keep track of the time. Okay, so try to quickly answer them. Um, ah, okay. So another good question from Ashier. So it's asking that uh, whether we always assume that we have just one type of shuffling. So the answer is no. So in principle, you could, for example, alternate. So you can use in one step, you know, your your favorite shuffle. The next step, your second favorite shuffle, and then again your favorite shuffle, then the second favorite shuffle. Um, but so the mathematics gets more complicated. So there is some mathematics for that. Um, so the kind of fancy term is inhomogeneous Markov chain, um, and and those are typically quite hard to, to analyze. But then the, there is there are some theorems for those. Okay, and finally a question from Loom. Um, about the stopping rules, um, does the person that starts the shuffle, the second person that starts the shuffling, starts at a different order? No. So right. So in the definition of uh, of uh, stopping rule, 
Um, so the second person, so in these kind of X hat orders, you, you start the same way. And so you assume that the stopping rule evaluated to J and that for the second person, they started from the same order and the first J orders they got are the same, you know, as for me, let's say. Great question. All right, that's awesome. You guys are so active. So thanks a lot for, for all these questions. And I guess, okay, at least everybody else got a break and that's fine. Um, and so I'm happy to restart and to, to move on to, to um, the second half of the lecture, the second bit of the lecture, right? And so, um, okay, I always get lost, right? So this is, I guess, part three in my numbering. And so what I want to um, quickly explain now is how to apply the theorem to the top to random shuffle. which is somehow the simplest example one can analyze. Um, all right. So I guess kind of the plan of attack should be clear, right? So the first thing we have to come up with is a uniform stopping rule. Right? And this is sort of kind of a mysterious art on its own, how to come up with this. And, you know, Aldous and the Iconis are kind of the leading artists in this area. And so the uniform stopping rule uh, in this case, so in the case of the top to random shuffle goes as follows. So let me very quickly recall what we're doing, right? So we start with a deck, right? And in the top to random shuffle, we take the top card and then we in, reintroduce it somewhere into the deck. So maybe here. And all the other cards stay in place. And then we keep going. So what is the stopping rule that we will use? Well, let's say that we mark the original bottom card. So this red X will indicate this bottom card, right? And so, um, you know, in my example, the bottom card after one shuffle just stayed in place. But you can imagine that as you keep shuffling, at some point, you will start introducing cards below this marked card. And so, um, you know, after a while, this bottom card will be, you know, somewhere else in the deck. And if you wait even longer, at some point, this bottom card will appear on top. Okay, so that's that this will happen inevitably again for the same reason as I mentioned when I was answering Asher's question. So you can first show that there is a positive probability that the bottom card lands on top. And then you know another small theorem tells you that it's actually inevitable to happen. So at some point it will actually be on top. And so our stopping rule will be kind of the next shuffle. So after the bottom card lands on top, by um, our algorithm, we will reintroduce it somewhere into the deck. So for example, here, right? So that's the card that got reintroduced and that's the original bottom card. And so, this number of shuffles that we need to get here is will be our capital T. So this is the first shuffle. This is the sec second shuffle. You know, this is some J's shuffle. Um, then, you know, we call T the, the number of shuffles until the original bottom card is being reintroduced into the deck. Okay, so T is the number of shuffles until um, this original bottom card is reintroduced into the deck. Okay, so um, let me kind of skip 
the explanation why it is a stopping rule. The more interesting part is why is it a uniform stopping rule? And this is a uniform stopping rule because of the following observation. So if you think about the cards that are below this marked card, then it's always true that the cards below it are uh, actually uniform. So uh, um, in a uniformly random order, meaning that all orders of these cards are equally likely, right? So let me maybe say it like that. So orders of cards below the mark card are all equally likely. Okay, so how can we prove it? Let me briefly explain. So we can argue by induction, um, right? So um, let me just indicate uh, how, how it works. So when you introduce the first card below the original bottom card, then you know for this one card, there is only one order. So there is nothing to prove. So that's sort of the base of induction. And now you kind of keep going. So when you introduce the second card somewhere below the um, original bottom card, by our algorithm, cards always introduced you know, at a random position in the deck, right? So the second card you introduced below the red card, it has equal probability to be on top of the first card or below the first card, right? So when you have um, a situation like this, so you have the original bottom card and you have introduced two cards below it, right? If you think about the last card that was introduced, it can be on top or at the bottom and both are equally like, right? And then you, you just keep arguing by induction. And so whenever you introduce a new card, an extra card below the red card, uh, it's always equally likely to be in any of the possible places. And so all orders actually equally like. And so what it means is that when I'm in this situation over here, right? So when my original bottom card is on top of the deck, then everybody else below it, all the orders of these cards are equally like. So the deck below it is perfectly shuffled. And so when I finally take this card, the original bottom card, the one with the red cross, and they reintroduce it, the entire deck is perfectly shuffled, right? And that's exactly what we mean by uniform uh, stopping. Okay, so we somehow magically came up with this uh, wonderful stopping rule. Okay, we actually didn't, the economists and all this did, but um, never mind. So we have this uh, rule. And so now by the theorem, we know that our quantity of interest, so let me just abbreviate it by this green blob, is less than the probability that T is bigger than K. Okay, so the only thing I have to analyze at this point is how likely it is that I need more than K shuffles to um, you know, reach this purple situation here. Okay, and so let me explain how we can analyze that. So the problem reduces now to analyzing these probabilities, the yellow probability start here. And so to analyze these probabilities, we decompose T as follows. So we um, Right, so we're interested in the number of shuffles until the top card is, so the original bottom card is on top and is reintroduced. Okay, so how long do we have to wait for that? Well, we can write it as T2 minus T1. Okay, let me actually start with T1. Okay, so let's say T1 is, the number of shuffles you need until you have one card 
below uh, original bottom card. So this marked card. Okay. So you have to wait a couple of shuffles until the first card appears below the marked card. Okay. Then you will have to wait some more until the second card appears below the marked card. So that's T2. Okay, and so on and so forth, right? And so um, when the N uh, minus first card appears below the bottom card, so this happens at time T N minus one. And after that, you just need one more shuffle, right? So, so, so this telescoping sum that I wrote down evaluates to Tn minus one. So that's the number of shuffles until my original bottom card is on top and the N minus one other cards are below it. And then after one more shuffle, I re reintroduce it and then I'm done, right? So then my deck is perfectly shuffled. Okay, and so now I can analyze the summons in my sum. So all of these uh, random summons, right? And so how do those behave? So I can look at the probabilities that these different summons take different values. Okay, so I can look at the probability it takes me some number of J shuffles until the first card is introduced below the original bottom card. So how many shuffles does that take? So, sorry, how, how, how um, likely is that? That it takes me J shuffles? Okay, so J shuffles means that the first J minus first times, J minus one times, I do not succeed. So I do not introduce anybody below my bottom card. Um, and that's pretty likely, right? So that has the probability N minus one over N, right? Because every time I introduce a card, it has n positions where it can go, and all of them are bad for me, except for one, except for the one position, which is at the bottom. So for T1 to be equal to J, it means that J minus one times I do not succeed, which every time happens with probability n minus one over n. And then finally, in the J's attempt, I take the top card, and that ends up indeed below the bottom card. So the probability of that is one over n, because again, there are n positions in total, and there is one which you know corresponds to a success. And so similarly, if I look at T2, for example, right? So I look at the probability that T2 minus T1 is equal to J. So now one card has been introduced below the bottom card and I wait for the next one. So now I have probability of failure of n minus two over n, because now there are two positions that are below the original bottom card and n minus two that are not. So j minus one times I have to fail. So I have to introduce the card in the wrong position. And then if I finally in the j's attempt, introduce it in the right position, namely below the original bottom card, then indeed T2 minus T1 will be equal to J and so on and so forth, right? And so, you know, if you want to learn some fancy terminology, so in probability, we call such random numbers geometric because these probabilities that I wrote down form a geometric sequence as, you know, functions of J and you know, we say that there is a success probability. So in the first case of one over n, um, you know, in the second case, we have a geometric random number with probability, success probability two over n uh, and so on. And so my quantity of interest, so my T, which was the sum of all these random numbers, plus one, right? I can say that it is a geometric 
1 over n quantity plus a geometric 2 over n quantity dot 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 so the second last summit is geometric with success probability n minus 1 over n and then they have this extra one okay so that's the quantity I want to analyze so I have all these geometric random quantities I take the sum and I'm interested in the probability that the sum is bigger than k okay so how to analyze that so again we're interested in the probability that t is greater than k okay so I want to compute or, or somehow estimate that all right so the way to do it is to um, use what we call in probability the coupon collector problem okay so when you take your first probability classes students at the university you will most likely encounter this problem but there's no harm to learn it now okay and so that goes as follows so in my childhood in Ukraine, in Kharkiv, uh, you know, one of the things we were collecting were stickers from chewing gum, right? So there was this chewing gum, which probably no longer exists because I'm old, and that was called Turbo. And so when you bought, you know, one of these chewing gums, it was wrapped in a sticker with a car. Okay, so you have this, uh, you know, chewing gum, um with with a sticker and you know there there was some number of stickers in total let's call it n and of course as a kid you know you want to collect all of these right because on each sticker there was some cool car uh, pictured on it and so you kind of keep buying this chewing gum uh you know not uh, exactly what your parents uh, want to see, but you, you kind of keep going until you have collected all these stickers, right? So, um, right. So, so, so you um, collect stickers, and you know if you're a stubborn kid like me, you will keep collecting until you have a full collection. Okay. And so, of course, the, the mean thing about it is that if you think about sort of the number of chewing gum, chewing gums that, that you buy, right, you can again think about sort of the number of gums you need to get your first sticker, right, and then, you know, you buy a bunch more. Um, until you get your second sticker and so on. And so the mean thing about it is that, of course, you just need to buy one gum to collect one sticker. So, you know, that, that comes immediately. But the second sticker is already a bit harder to get, right? And so if you think about it, it's one of these geometrics Right, so when you buy the next gum, you could see the same sticker or, or a new one. And so here you succeed with a fairly large probability because you know most of the stickers you don't have yet. But as you keep going, you know, things get more difficult. And in particular, for the very last card that you want to collect, it will really take you a while to, to get that sticker, right? Because you will kind of keep finding the stickers that you have already collected. So there are maybe 99 of those, and the last 100th one will be kind of pretty hard uh, to find. And so, you know, the last, so the number of uh, gums that you will have to buy until you have collected this last sticker um, will be geometric with success probability only one over it. So it will take you a while. And so now if you compare this kind of my childhood story about sticker collection and the random quantity you get here to the one that shows up in card shuffling, you realize they're actually exactly the same, right? So we have exactly the same sum just ordered 
you know, in opposite direction, but, you know, still the sum is the same, right? And so now if I look at the probability that T is bigger than K, I can translate it into this um, coupon collector, or in my case, sticker collector problem, right? So um, it will be just the probability that I um, haven't collected all the stickers after buying K of these chewing gums, right? So in other words, you know, there is some sticker I, okay, so let's say sticker of a Ferrari that I haven't managed to, to find, um, uh, so which is not, so not in the first K gums. Okay, and so how can I estimate this probability? So it could be any of those cars, right, that I haven't managed to collect. So the probability that there is some car that I haven't collected yet is smaller than the sum of the probabilities that, so over all these possibilities, so all the different cars I, the probability that um, you know I haven't collected sticker I, so not collected by the case um, attempt, so the case gum that I buy. Okay, and so what I so first of all, all these probabilities are the same, right? So I have n times n as the number of stickers and so the number of cards. Um, n times the same probability. And what is the probability that, you know, this particular card, say Ferrari, was not in the first K gums? Well, the probability is that I was collecting something else that so I was getting one of the other n minus one stickers um, in the K attempts. So the probability is n minus one over n uh, to power K. All right, and so to analyze it, um, let me write it uh, slightly differently, right? So this ratio I can write as one minus one over n and then use kind of one of our usual inequalities that I'm sure you have learned for, for Olympiads. So when you raise one minus something to power k, you can estimate that by e to k times the something, right? So at the end of the day, right? So at the end of the lecture, what we have learned, what we, we realize is that the probability that my uniform random time, uh, sorry, my uniform stopping rule is bigger than K is at most, and so the number of cards times E to the minus K, the number of shuffles over N. Right, so in particular, if I choose K to be of the form N log N plus some number, let's say C star times N for some positive C star, right? So then the probability that my um, uniform random time happens after k shuffles is at most n times e to the power minus k over n. So let me divide k by n. I will get log n and then c star over n. Uh, sorry, just c star, right? So the n um, is divided through. And so e to the minus log n is, of course, 1 over n times n is 1. So I end up with e to the minus c star. And so, you know, this I can use as my positive number c. Okay, so to kind of recap, right? So let's say you have some threshold c, like a quarter, which describes well-shuffled decks, right? And what we wanted to know is how many shuffles in the stop to random uh, algorithm do we need to hit the threshold of one quarter, 
Okay, so to answer this question, what you have to do is take the logarithm to create the C star, right? So the C star is just the negative of the logarithm of C. And then what we know from our analysis now is that if you take this number of shuffles, so n log n plus c star times n shuffles, so c star is your constant and n is the number of cards, this number of shuffles will be enough to get a well shuffled deck you know, for this threshold c, right? And so, you know, as the, the last thing that I want to say, kind of in the main part of the lecture, is that if you look at this um, underlined, red underlined expression, it is somehow dominated by this n log n, right? So typically n is large. So for example, in the casino, you might play with 10 decks or so. So uh, you would have something like 520 cards. And in that case, n log n is much bigger than n. So approximately, you need these n log n shuffles. And so kind of as a simplified conclusion, we can say that in the top to random shuffle, we need um, n log n shuffles to get a well shuffled deck, right? And so, for example, if you take um, a regular deck of cards and you compute what this is, so you take 52 times the natural log of 52, that's approximately 204 or 205. We'll look it up, 205. Okay, so indeed, this is not a very practical shuffle because you don't want to shuffle 205 times, but you know, at least we could analyze it mathematically, right? And so sort of the good news is that for the ripple shuffle, which is a bit harder to analyze, you actually need way fewer shuffles and you get, you know, to an order of seven shuffles or so to analyze 52 cards. So, you know, it's much more efficient. And it turns out you can analyze it in the same way, just that this mysterious art of finding the uniform random time is more complicated there. So you have to be even more clever to come up with such a thing. All right, that's pretty much all I wanted to say. And of course, happy to take any questions about the lecture or anything else. Thank you for this uh, wonderful uh, talk, Misha. It was really great fun. So maybe I can I can kick off uh, our questions by asking you when we are going to hit the casino. Ah, yeah, anytime. So <laughs> <laughs> can we bring Percy along? Sorry. Should we bring Percy along? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, maybe maybe, fun, I'm sure. maybe he's not allowed. <laughs> I think he has spent a non-trivial time of his life in Las Vegas. And in fact, I think he was consulting for many of the casinos there, as far as I know. Make sure they are playing safe. Exactly, yes. <laughs> uh questions from the audience. Isra, would you like uh to ask your question? To ask your question? Um sure. Um What's the analog for uh, the riffle shuffle? So like how many um, riffle shuffles should you need to have the deck be well shuffled? Right, so yeah, so basically uh, it depends on how exactly you set um, this number C. So um, yeah, depending on, on that, you, you know, you end up with something like five or seven shuffles. Um, but basically it's much more efficient uh, as you would imagine, right? Because in the riffle shuffle somehow, you really change the order quite a bit. So you, you would think that you would need much fewer. And that's indeed the case. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, David. I'd also like to ask about uh, another shuffle. So yep. you split the deck in two and then try to insert one half of the deck into another half so that, mm, let us say, the first uh, card from the first half is under the 
first the card from the second half and so on. Is it possible to analyze this kind of shuffling? Okay, so you want to be, so, so you're, you're split in two equal parts, if I understand correctly. And mm -hmm. it, it's always, you know, one, one, two, two, or three, three. Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I see, I see. Okay, uh, that's a good question. So um, yes, so I mean, th this has been analyzed so the kind of interesting thing here is that the shuffle is actually not random, right? So you actually, the mathematical analysis turns out to be quite a bit different uh, here. And mm -hmm. so you're kind of in, in a different sort of field of mathematics, namely dynamical systems. So this concept of, you know, getting something well shuffled, it's, you know, there, there is a random version, which I discussed mm -hmm. today, the not a non-random version. And so for both of them, we have a lot of theory. So if you're interested in these kind of things, you know, you, you should look at, you know, Google things like discrete dynamical systems. Mm -hmm. you, you, know, you will find information on that. So I, I don't have an answer on the top of my head, but there are mm -hmm. kind of different techniques that they could describe, if you like, um, for, for yeah. how to analyze these non-random systems. But in okay. fact, it's actually more complicated. So somehow analyzing the random one. So first of all, randomness tends to speed up mixing. So typically, you would need fewer shuffles when something is random. Yeah. And secondly, the mathematical analysis is actually simpler for, for those, typically. Mm -hmm. And what about the second? Uh, what about the riffle shuffle? Uh, yes. Does it guarantee that we get any order of cards? Yes. So uh, yes. So I think that, that one you can um, yeah prove just exactly in the same way as I was describing in the break, right? So basically, whenever you have a Markov chain, and, and that's for example one place where randomness helps. All I have to prove is that I can go from any order to any other order with positive mm -hmm. probability. So as soon as mm -hmm. it is possible, mm -hmm. it's actually inevitable that it will happen, right? Mm -hmm. So, so probability, mm -hmm. will, we call these, you know, zero, one loss. So as soon as something has probability more than zero, it has probability one. And it's not always true, but for, for, for these Markov chains, it is actually true. Um, okay, and so then the reason why, why um, why you have a positive probability is just the same as before because you here you split in unequal parts, right? So so in particular with positive probability you will just split into the top card and the rest, right? And then when you do kind of the riffling part with positive probability the top card will land you know at the bottom or you know at the particular location where, where mm -hmm. you want to land right and then in the next step again there is positive probability that you will just take one card off and, and reintroduce it and with positive probability it will end up exactly in the right place and, and so on and so therefore um you, you, yeah you can see that there is already a positive probability to get to any other order that, that you like thank you uh, David, I actually have a question for you. Uh, so you uh, participated very successfully in the contest of the uh, Ukrainian uh, Junior Academy of Sciences with a project. Is that correct? Mm, do you mean man or what? Uh, so yes, exactly. <laughs> yes, Junior mm -hmm. Academy of Sciences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, can you tell us very briefly about your project? Mm. It was actually about the uh, probabilities. So this uh, subject is really familiar to me. And uh, uh, there was a problem. Uh, it was called uh, the random box problem. And it is about um, the fact that we inevitably get um, somewhere when it is with... Um, with, pos oh, with positive probability. But uh, there we had a line with integers 
and mm -hmm. with some probability we got uh, up and with and with some probability we got down mm -hmm. and we had to compute the the probability that we sometimes get to the minus one and mm -hmm. uh, yeah but uh, it uh, uh, it really uh, sometimes it depended on the probability p mm, that mm -hmm. means that we go up or down the critical mm -hmm. um, value was one half so that's where the graph changed mm. if we uh, draw those probabilities into a graph then one half is the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and also there were a few paradoxes uh, the monte hall paradox and the burst birthday paradox but those are about our intuition uh, about our gut feeling that it's often uh, is not correct and uh, we are not always good at understanding the probabilities for example the birthday the birthday paradox it says that if there are uh, about 20 people at the party then uh, there is the probability that at least two of them have the birthday at the same day is at least uh, one half mm -hmm. so it seems to be incredible because there are a lot of days in the year and only 20 people so right yeah there is i can give actually one more example of such a paradox or something that seems so super counterintuitive. So one example often used in lectures is about elections, right? So, so, so suppose you have an election with two candidates, mm -hmm. right? And you have, let's say, one million voters in total. So roughly, let's say we have an election in Kharkiv, which when the population is on that order, Right, and so you have two candidates, and let's say, except for one thousand people, everybody is indifferent, so they vote at random. Okay, so pick one of the two candidates somehow at random, and but one thousand people are really convinced, so they really like, let's say, the first candidate. So those one thousand will definitely vote for that person. Okay, and so then the question is. You know how likely do you think it is that this first person will be elected what what, what would your guess be mm -hmm. and there there is one one million people here yeah one million people and so one million minus one thousand people uh you know do a 50 50 they, they flip a coin or whatever and then one thousand people they are really convinced they go for for candidate one mm -hmm. so it seems that uh, the candidate one he has more chances but mm, right. i i feel that there is something wrong with it and no that, so that, that that's correct but so so the kind of interesting thing is 1000 seems like not so much out of a million but actually the probability that candidate one will win is more than 99%. In fact, I think it's even more than 99.9%. .9%. So, you know, if you have a really tiny group of people who are really convinced that they, they will actually basically decide the election. So, mm. yeah, that's probably because uh, when we just flip a coin, then uh, the, the general result, it is somewhere near zero. And if we uh, add even a small a while amount of votes to one candidate, then we uh, almost definitely get above zero. You mean that? Yeah, exactly. It's a little mm -hmm. bit like mm -hmm. this random walk that you described. So, so there are also yeah, yeah that's right. If, so, if you, for example, yeah, just go with your p slightly above one half, 
then mm -hmm. it dramatically changes the outcome. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we need to watch that um, in our next elections. And I, I believe the election is coming up in the United States next year. That's next right. Month. Yes. <laughs> OK, I, I think yeah. the model is very different. Yeah, I think it's more like <laughs> Everyone is designed, well, maybe, except maybe, for maybe. very small fraction. For wants to the advantage <laughs> <laughs> of more crazy to happen. Shi Hyang, uh, you've been raising your hand for a while. Yeah, I'm just um, answering David's question about um, if the riffle shuff shuffle becomes perfect. Um, so it turns out that actually after eight perfect riffle shuffles, it will return to its, its original state. So I actually think I linked an article in the chat. Cool. Amazing. Thanks. Thank you, Shikan. Uh, will you tell us uh, who you wrote that article for? Um, this is, I was doing a math circle um, called the Euler circle. Mm -hmm. um, and as part of each course, you have to write, you have, you write an expository paper on the, mm -hmm. on the topic that's mm -hmm. not covered in class. So this was for part of a Mark of Change class. Mm -hmm. Cool. Very Great. cool. Say hi to and Simon from me. So I assume he was teaching you there, right? So uh, uh, yeah. Simon is a classmate of uh, Misha's from Stanford. Exactly. We also actually, I think, did you, were you the same incoming class, Misha? Yeah, we were exactly in the same class. Yeah. Uh, Loom, uh, hello. Hi, uh, I want to ask a question. Like, what would happen if instead of a 1 million, it would be much more? Like, Ah, yeah, so it, it basically, um, right, so so what matters is kind of the, the ratio of these two quantities, right? So, um, yeah, so if you have 10,000 out of 10 million, then, then you, you roughly get the same answer. So, so it mainly depends on the ratio of these two numbers. Mm -hmm. So even one in a thousand, huh? Yeah, exactly. So one in a thousand will, will, will basically decide the election. I, re oh, I feel very special. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So th this is something you should tell to people who say, uh, my vote doesn't count anyway yeah. because I'm just one person. So th that's a it's good example. Exactly what we, will, what we should tell them. Um, yeah, is they agree. Um, um, Boris, uh, I'm sorry, Volotomia, um, uh, will you ask your question that you posted in the chat? Uh, good, yeah, good evening. Uh, yeah, um, hello, good evening. You mentioned Markov chains uh, in your lecture, and can you please may explain for me, can Markov chains be used in Poisson flow? Because I heard that uh, Poisson flow has stationary effects and we can utilize Markov processes in it. Okay, so Poisson flow has, you know, it's used in different contexts, so maybe you can explain what do you mean exactly? And it will be easier to answer. So, so what do you mean by Poisson flow? Uh, no, it's just um, uh, Poisson regular flow. We we know the Poisson process. It's random process, and it's characterized by Poisson regular flow. And you likewise mentioned the uh, Markov chains in your lecture. And that's, yeah, I know that's the Poisson flow that wasn't in lecture, you know. But um, I just wondering, can Markov chains be used with Poisson flow? Right. OK. So, yeah. So, if you, um, you mean uh, Poisson process, then um, so po Poisson process is actually, you know, a particular example of a Markov chain, right? So, um, you can um, right so so it's a so-called continuous time Markov chain because in the Poisson process you know something happens at a random you know continuous time so it's something along the lines of you know waiting for a random amount of time and then I shuffle my cards then I wait another random amount of time then I shuffle my cards again and so on and so, yeah, so this is something that, um, yeah, it can, can be also viewed basically as a mark of chain. So, um, but, but 
it has so, so the ones I described today, we think of them as being in discrete time. So somehow, you know, at time one, you shuffle, time two, you shuffle again, at time three, you shuffle again. And, and the, the ones that you're asking about, the time is continuous. So something happens sort of at random times. But it, it turns out that, you know, many, um, much of the analysis is actually the same or, or very similar for, for both kinds. Yes, thank you. Sure. Yeah, so so for example, if you imagine, let's say, a, a Poisson process, so where, you know, at random times, you go up by one, right? Um, but, but, but imagine that, you know, all the time, your number decreases at rate one, right? So you're, you're kind of sliding down with slope one, and then at a random time, you jump up by one, then you kind of slide down, for some random time, again, you jump by one and so on. So in, in such a situation, um, you will also have, um, you know, some kind of distribution in the limit. So like a uniform distribution of orders. And you can also think about, you know, how long it takes until you're close to the distribution that you get after a large time. So, you know, there are kind of parallel concepts to, to these, um, you, you know, to, to mixing times, number of shuffles you need, and so on. So, so it's very, very, very similar. Misha, there's also, Loom asked the question of further reading. Is there an introductory book that you really like? Um, okay, so Loom, maybe, can you be more specific? So, you're interested in reading on Markov chains, or on, on card shuffling, or you know, on probability in general. Um, what, what would be of interest to you? Mm. Oh, sorry, I had muted. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Okay, so I was thinking more of something introduction to Markov chains, or okay. let's connect it also to shuffling or stuff like this. Um, Okay, so uh, let me actually just post it in the chat. Um, yeah, th so there are, of course, many different um, books on Markov chains, but, you know, one nice one is the book by Levin and Paris called Markov Chains and Mixing Times. Okay, so mixing time is just kind of a fancy word for what we learned today. So it's this amount of time and number of shuffles you need until your bell shuffle. So, you know, it's usually referred to as mixing time. And so, right, so this book by Levin in Paris, Paris is, you know, precisely about how you can study these mixing times for different kinds of Markov chains. So that, that, that would be a good reading around the topics of today. Uh, incidentally, Misha, what's your favorite mathematics book? Oh, OK. That's a really difficult question. What's the book that is? Uh... So I think when I was at the age of the participants, it was proofs from the book. So I, I really like that one. And I think I noticed that one of the authors, uh, so Professor Ziegler, will actually present right at some point. He'll be shooting uh, tenants at sparrows. Yes. Yes, very good. So, yeah, so I think at that time that was my favorite book. Um, yeah, I guess these days, a good question. Yeah, I think these days I can name a few favorite papers, and that's one I presented by Eidos and Diaconius is definitely one of them. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, yeah. I guess when you're sort of in the research mathematician stage, you kind of mostly read papers rather than books. So, so it's hard. To, so I, I can name books that I like as an undergrad. For, so, for example, I really like the book by Dudley on real analysis and probability. So it has. So it's a nice introduction to probability, sort of an advanced one. And it has all sorts of pathological counterexamples. So, you know, if you guys are into kind of uh, counterintuitive things, so, you know, 
counterexamples to things that you would think are true, then you know that book is really great for that. So it constructs all sorts of objects that you wouldn't think exist, but that they actually do. So you know, also in analysis of things like you know curves that fill space completely, or, you know, the, the sort of objects that you wouldn't expect to exist, but that are out there. Very cool. Um, any other questions from the audience? Okay, so we go. Oh, is there another question? Um, yeah, it was a more uh, specific question. Um, so when you're talking about uh, the top to random shuffle and the other shuffles, um, does it matter how we perform the random action? Like if we were to take the um, top card and then put it like randomly in the first half of the deck or like something like that, does it uh, mm -hmm. change this drastically? Yeah, it actually does matter. So, so this um, idea of um, uniform stopping rules, it's very delicate. So you, it, it's sort of very easy to, to break it. So for example, you can see that if you were to enter um, the card, um let's see yeah exactly so if you were to enter the card always in the top half of the deck um so the capital t that we have constructed here would no longer be a uniform random time so you would have already to come up with something new to, to analyze it. right because re remember the reason it was uniform random was this property that below the smart card everything was had the same probability all orders right but now imagine your mark card is let's say three quarters up and now you you start introducing cards you know always into the top half of the deck so now the order you can create you you create below the smart card is no longer you know perfectly random right not all orders equally likely so so it, our proof already breaks down so, so basically, as soon as we change the shuffle a little bit, typically you need the new proof. So it's not very robust in that sense. Thank you. Sure. So um, uh, I would like to propose something. Misha, you are our first Ukrainian speaker in the Hakifi in uh, International Science School. Uh, so maybe... Uh, uh, I'd like to propose that maybe the Ukrainian students in the audience uh, stay behind and you uh, uh, can um, uh, uh, chat with uh, with, Mika, uh, with Misha uh, yeah. and Mipo. Uh, and I'll also be staying even though I don't understand Ukrainian. Uh, but um, um, and, and for uh, all other members of the audience, of course, you're welcome to stay behind and uh, uh, and listen to Ukrainian, uh, maybe pick up one thing or the other, but um, I, I would call um, uh, call it a night uh, for the uh, general part of today's lecture. And thank uh, Misha very much again. Thank you, Misha. Thank you for attending. So Ukrainian students stay behind, please. Слухачі з України залишаються, якщо хтось не зрозумів пропозицію Ніхеля. Will you stop sharing your screen, Misha? Ah, yes. Uh, So, the floor is yours. <laughs>